Is there a worshiper in the house tonight? Come on, is there a worshiper on a Wednesday night? Is there a problem that needs to be solved? Is there a sin that needs to be repented of? Is there a God that needs to be praised? I said, is there a God that's worthy of praise? Why don't you call him by his name tonight? Come on, why don't you call him by his name? I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Beautiful worship on a Wednesday night. What a beautiful group of people. Anybody in here ever been criticized for doing the right thing? Kevin, Terry, you've taken a, some punishment this week, but you did the right thing, son. And I applaud you as a godly man and someone that I respect. And uh, I just had to say that because it's been stuck in my crawl all week long. And uh, he had, uh, had to punish his child, and uh, we've all had to do that. I didn't do it near enough. I was punished too much, but I didn't punish mine enough. It's kind of he got caught in a trap there. And so all the gossip you hear, let me tell you something. Kevin Terry will do to ride the river with every single day. He's a good man. So let's just give him a hand if we could do that. And I hope that's recorded and somebody puts that on television or something. So Hebrews chapter 10, let me ask you a question. What a good-looking good group of young people upstairs, downstairs, everywhere. Good to see some of our guests becoming regulars back here, even on a Wednesday night. Uh, question for a believer. By the way, we're moving, uh, trying to get moved in by Saturday, so my crew has been helping me move, and then Katie almost cut her finger and has to have surgery to get the tendons just it's been one of those days anybody ever had one of those days and and so uh uh thank you for your patience and and for the first time in 16 years of pastoring here i'll be living just a few minutes down the road and that's that's exciting as long as you don't drop by every day that's exciting Now, did I say that? I went in my notes. <laughs> For a believer, what is the greatest promise in the Bible? It's okay to be wrong. We won't just talk it out. Holy, I thought Holy Ghost, that's a great promise. Holy Spirit's a great promise. It's not the answer, but it's a great one. Good try. I asked Brock, and Brock's not very spiritual. He just blew it completely. Poor church. And considering uh, for a believer, for someone that's had that's been saved, if you if you're 90 years old and you're laying on your deathbed, what's the greatest promise? He that shall come will come. The greatest promise in the Bible is the promise of eternal life with Jesus in heaven. For a believer. Am I right? Marty said, I knew I was on the right track when Marty started talking about heaven. Now, not everybody's talking about heaven. And I, 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 and I, I don't want to just keep opening a wound, but I promise you today that for Edna, heaven's a little bit sweeter. Because there's an old man up there that wants to. I promise you. It's a great promise. And without that promise, what would life be? How many have your loved one in heaven you'd like to see one of these days? So am I right? Is it the greatest promise? My grandfather was the worker at the 11th hour, but I believe that God's mercy stretched all the way. 
for years, for decades, for centuries, for millennia, people have been looking at the sky. Even the greatest preacher, Paul the Apostle, looked at the sky, watching the clouds, listening for the sound, hoping, praying to catch a glimpse of the fulfillment of the greatest prophecy and the greatest promise in the history of the world. Since Adam and Eve walked out of the Garden of Eden, the greatest promise is we're going to get to go back to paradise. Today you will be with me. Paradise. I'm fired up about talking about it. The worse the world gets, the better heaven looks. The world's full of problems. I don't know if you paid any much attention lately, but everybody wants to kill everybody. Everybody hates everybody. Everybody's marrying everybody. When did the government have the right to dictate that? I thought that was a God thing. Why did we ever have to go to the courthouse to get a marriage license? Why didn't we go to the church house to get one? It's just a little thought. We have subrogated our responsibility as a people of God, as a kingdom of God, as a church of God. And we've given much of our responsibility to our government, and guess what? It's not working. And they're taking godly things and twisting them. Thank God. Thank God that it's a heaven. Now, let me prove to you that I'm right. God bless you. You may be seated. Sister Johnson, I just got a word from the Lord for you. I don't know what's going on in your life, but you're a precious saint, and uh, it's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. There's a precious saint of God. There's many, many precious saints of God in this house. Let's allow God to use us a little bit. If you feel something, you feel like telling somebody something, you know what the Spirit of the Lord does? It edifies. I didn't say, Sister Johnson, you need to straighten up, did I? No, but it's this edifying thing. When you feel something for somebody, just feel that. Sister Johnson and I, we've been together, been a pastor long enough that we got a connection. She's come to me and say, Pastor, the Lord told me to tell you this, and she's always right because she's been praying for me. That's relationship. That's a three-way relationship between me and her and the Lord. Is that all right? We need more of that. Amen. Hebrews chapter 10. For yet a little while, and who he who is coming. Anybody know who that is? When Jesus will come and will not tarry. Now, if the just shall live by faith, now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back. You wouldn't be here on Wednesday night if you were a drawer backer. We're not those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. Those who believe to the saving of the soul, what's the greatest promise? He who shall come will come. Now, if you're a drawer backer, that's not the greatest promise. Matter of fact, you kind of wish that wasn't a promise. But if you are one of those that don't draw back, if you're one of those that have believe to the saving of the soul, the greatest promise you'll ever hear is that the good Lord is coming back one of these days to get his people. And if the value of a doctrine is judged by its frequency in Scripture, then the coming of the Lord must be very important. Without exception, every New Testament writer spoke about it. Almost every Old Testament writer spoke about it. Jesus himself spoke about his own return. So it must be very important, and it must be part of the fulfillment of the purpose of God. As a matter of fact, I will tell you the reason for everything that's happened since Adam and Eve walked out of the Garden of Eden, the reason for the day of Pentecost, the reason for the tabernacle in the wilderness, the reason for all of that. What's the reason? Why does it all happen? So that one of these days he can draw out of this earth a bride. 
The whole reason for everything, the reason you're here on church on Wednesday night, we want to do better and we want to live better lives and we want to be nicer people and we want things to go. We want to be forgiven of the mistakes we've made. But the reason you're here on Wednesday night, if you have to bullet it back, I want to go to heaven. Am I right? I want to go to heaven. Taco Bell is open. That's where you should be. <laughs> Don't get me laughing, Jones. <laughs> he came to Bethlehem the first time. Anybody know where he's coming the second time? The Bible's very specific. He came to Bethlehem, but you go about 10 miles down the road from Bethlehem, he's going to come back to a place called the Mount of Olives. And he's going to set his foot on the Mount of Olives, and the Scripture says it would cleave in two. That's a pretty big footstep. That when he sets his foot on that mount, it's going to rip it in half. And he's going to set up a kingdom on the earth that will never pass away. And the universe will be ruled from Jerusalem. People say, well, heaven's in the sky. No, it, it, it is right now, but heaven is coming down to earth. And the universe is going to be ruled from the city of David. Because what the Lord says, he said, I'm going to put my name there, David, and it's never going to go away. And a descendant of David is going to rule for eternity. Who is that descendant? Jesus, thou son of David, Bartimaeus said. Have mercy on me. By the way, you know what we're going to do Sunday? Just go back to Sunday. We're going to shout a little bit Sunday. I think we had about 120 seconds of shouting on Sunday that I'm still, I tell, I've told everybody all week about just shouting. Man. His first coming comprised of what? His birth, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And Paul said in 1 Corinthians that that's the good news of the gospel. But that's only half the gospel. His first coming is half of the gospel. And might I say it's not the good half, even though that's real good. But the best half of the gospel is so that those that obey the first half of the gospel is that he's coming back. He came to Bethlehem. He's coming to the Mount of Olives. He came the first time for a funeral, and the second time he's coming for a wedding. Woo! I miss the funeral, but I'm not missing the wedding. Can I get a witness? Behold, he cometh with ten thousands of his saints. Let's get into some scriptures and let me. Early in the Old Testament, we read of a man named Enoch. Anybody ever heard of Enoch? The proper pronunciation, I believe, is Enoch. Enoch walked with God and was not, for God took him. What does that mean? Enoch was walking down the road, and the next step, he was in heaven. What did, and the scripture says that Enoch left the earth and he appeared in heaven. What did Enoch say? Jude quoted Enoch. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, seven generations from Adam, prophesied about these men also saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints. Man. From Genesis to Malachi. you can find the second coming of the Lord. Abraham sought for a city whose builder and maker was God. He found no continuing city, the writer of Hebrews said, but by faith he's going to walk on those golden streets one day. Jacob prophesied that the king of Judah the lion of the tribe of Judah is coming back. David wrote in the Psalms about 
the glorious returning of the king of glory. Isaiah said that the Lord is coming. Zechariah wrote about, you want to study the millennial, probably the best place to go is the book of Zechariah. And he talked about the millennial reign of Christ after his return to the earth. He that shall come will come. In the New Testament, you just barely start reading in the New Testament. And John the Baptist, a crazy man, said that he's going to set up a kingdom, and to his kingdom there will be no end. And what did he say? He said, he's going to set up a kingdom, and to his kingdom there will be no end. That was his sermon. What was his altar call? Because he's coming, and he's going to set up a kingdom, and there's going to be no end of that kingdom, repent. If that's true, then what should we do? If it really is true that he's coming and he's going to set up a kingdom and to his kingdom there should be no end, then what are we to do? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus himself said, I will return in the clouds with power and great glory. He stood on the Mount of Olives and he preached a sermon on the mountain. It's the same mountain he's going to return to. And he spoke about his plan for the city of Jerusalem when he came back. And I didn't read all those scriptures, but I probably should have, but I got plenty of scriptures. But just before Calvary, just before his crucifixion, he said, John, I want you to write this down. In chapter 14, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. What did he say? In my Father's house are many mansions in the King James. If it were not true, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am there you may be also Woo. somebody say amen I don't know about you but that's beautiful words after his resurrection the angels stood by on that same mountain. What did the angel say in Acts chapter 1 and verse number 11? Men of Galilee, why stand you here gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. What a promise. He's coming back. The very first thing that was said when he went away was, he's coming back. He made sure that he had messenger angels. He had angels that belonged to Gabriel. Stand there and say, hey, he's coming back. The same Gabriel that spoke of his coming to the shepherds spoke of his return. So John the Baptist Jesus himself, the angels. I don't know about you, but I'm seeing a pattern here. The angels, when he went away, then 50 days after his crucifixion, they call it Pente, which stands for 50. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. It filled all the house where they were sitting. There appeared in them cloven tongues like as a fire, and they all began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. What happened on the day of Pentecost? The second chapter of Acts, Peter was preaching. In Acts chapter 2, in verse number 19 and verse number 20, what did he say? The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. Verse 20. The sun, go back to verse 19 if you could, Tim. I, I, I may have not have given you verse 19. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath blood and fire and vapor. All this stuff's going to go on. 
And then what's going to happen in verse number 20, the sun will be turned into darkness, the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. You can read about it once you get past the book of Acts in Romans chapter 8, in Romans chapter 11, in Romans chapter 16. As a matter of fact, Romans says that we are saved by the hope of his return. That without that hope, we couldn't be saved. Why are, why are we living for God? Because we've got hope for a better world. Woo. Then you get past Romans into the next book and you get into 1 Corinthians. It's one of my favorites. Paul's longest letter. and I got to read it. And I read it at a lot of funerals but because it's good news. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we we shall all be changed. Not everybody's going to die. There's going to be people on the earth when he comes back. Verse 52. We're going down through 50. In a moment. Everybody say in a moment. In one twenty-fifth of a second, in the twinkling of an eye at the last. That doesn't mean we're all going to be gone in the twinkling of an eye. We're going to be changed in the twinkling of an eye. We're going to leave like he left. They watched him go away, and the angel said, just like you've seen him go away, he's coming back, and he's, we're going to go away like that, but we're going to be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, the seventh. Everybody, somebody say the seventh trumpet. The Bible fits together. It talks about the seals and the vials and the trumpet, and when you start talking about the trumpet, he said the last trumpet, that's the seventh trumpet. If you want to find out when that happens, you go find, talk about the seventh trumpet. It's the last trumpet. Somebody say amen. The Bible fits together. He did just put that in there for no reason. It's so you would know when he's coming. And the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. Somebody ought to say amen. And this mortal must put on immortality. Why? Verse 54. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death, you're finally defeated for good. Death is swallowed up in victory. What did he have when he returned from the grave? He had the keys of death and of hell. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, hell. Oh, grave. Oh, Hades, where is your victory? Ooh. Paul talks about it in Ephesians. Paul talks about it in Timothy. And he calls it the blessed hope. All through the book of Hebrews, it's mentioned time after time. Chapter 9 of the book of Hebrews is my favorite, verse 27 and 28. It's appointed for men once to die, but after this, the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time. Apart from sin for salvation. By the way, whoa, 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 leave it right there. When are you saved? Well, I say back 1973. No, you weren't, honey. You're going to be saved when he shows up the second time. <laughs> what a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. When I look upon his face, I knew a little lady one time that sang that song pretty good. What a hope. Somebody say amen. James was the younger brother of Jesus. Had the same mama, different daddy. Was his half-brother. Jesus was his older brother. He said, my big brother's coming back. Hmm. Simon Peter warned the scoffers. He said, where's the signs? Where's the proof that he's coming back? And Peter said, you better watch out what you say about that. You want to blaspheme the spirit of the Lord, you start saying he's not coming back. Again, Jude quoted Enoch in 
the book of Jude, behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of saints. In Revelation, it's in red letters, behold, I come quickly. I just read this and I Googled it, so it's got to be true. That one out of every 30 scriptures deals with the second coming of the Lord. And I don't think that's an exaggeration. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. And you know what the number one thing the Spirit says? I'm coming home. I'm coming back. I'm going to take you home with me. I'm coming back. I'm coming back. I'm coming. He that hath an ear, let him hear that he that shall come will come. It is the world's greatest promise. Men are unconcerned about their souls. We're worried about Labor Day weekend. You've got to be kidding me. Men aren't concerned about their souls. We are seeking treasures on earth. Like these orange socks. I love them. That's such an extreme example. But it's so true. We're more concerned about the color of our socks than whether or not we're going to heaven. I got a cramp in my leg when I threw it up there. I can't do that again. Hang on just a second. We're not concerned about the greatest promise in the world. We're relying on the promise of our boss. Or the promise of her spouse. You may have the best spouse in the world, and they can promise you something, but they can't swear it. Why can they not swear it? Why does the Bible tell you not to swear? Because you have no idea whether you're going to be alive tomorrow or not. Only God can swear. When God swears, he says, it'll happen no matter what. We can promise if the Lord allows, if the Lord wills, then I will do it. That's what the difference between a promise and a swear is. Only God can swear because when God says it's going to happen, bless God, it's going to happen. If I tell you I'll be there tomorrow at 3, I may or may not be. I may have a car wreck on the way. I may run into a traffic jam. I may go see my maker. I don't know. So I cannot swear to you I'll be there tomorrow. But if God says he'll be there tomorrow at 3, that's a swear. God swore he's coming back again. The only one that can swear swore he's coming back again. I believe with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength, I believe it just as as much as I believe anything that I've ever heard in my life, I believe the Lord's coming back. Does anybody believe that? And that's an anchor. That's a place, a nail in a sure place. That's something I can hang on to. That's something I can lay a hold of and count on. My 93-year-old grandmother passed away in the evening. Before she passed away, the last word she said to us, Ma'am, are you going to get better? And she just said, I just want to go see Jesus. Hmm. (laughs) She got her promise. Got a messed up world. I got, I need to be done, but can I just take another minute? Go into part two for a minute. Calvary was a great event. Why? It brought redemptive blood, not just human blood, but innocent blood. Hadn't been such a thing. 
hadn't been such a thing. The, 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 the tainting of the blood and the, the sin that caused the blood. There was, and, and the angels kept him that lest he dash his foot against the stone. How come he couldn't dash his foot against the stone? There wasn't time for him to bleed yet because the blood that coursed through his veins was innocent blood. He couldn't bleed a drop. And so they didn't, the angels just watched him. He was running around the yard barefooted with his brothers. He couldn't dash his foot. What was flowing through his veins was different than what had ever flowed through anyone else's veins since Adam. He was called the second Adam because Adam was the first one that had innocent blood. But when he, the temptation came to Adam, Adam, Adam was in the Garden of Eden and he was tempted and he fell. But the second Adam, he was in the wilderness. He was in a desert and he was, he was led up into the desert to be tempted of the devil and he walked out of there and he succeeded. Where the first Adam failed, the second Adam succeeded. The first Adam had innocent blood. But the second Adam, Adam had innocent blood as well. The difference is the first Adam failed the temptation. The second Adam passed the test. Come on, that's some good preaching. Somebody say amen. So the Calvary brought redemptive blood. Marty and I sat at the movie theater, and that's the first time I'd been to a movie theater in over 20 years. And I, we sat there and watched that Passion of the Christ. And if you've never watched it, you ought to humble yourself and make yourself keep your eyes open and watch it. It'll put you on your face. I sat, and Marty and I were both just crunching down on our seat. We were, we were just, oh, oh, oh. But the first time they hit him with that whip, I elbowed Marty, and I said, it's over. Because when he hit him with that whip, some red blood started oozing out of that stripe on his back, and it fell off of his back and onto the ground. And the first time that innocent blood hit that guilty ground, it started crying better things than the blood of Abel. What did the blood of Abel cry? Guilty, guilty, guilty. But the blood of Jesus said, innocent, 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 innocent. I'm going to cover you in my blood. I'm thankful that the blood of Abel is outshouted by the blood of Jesus. The blood of Abel pointed its gnarly finger at Cain and said, you're guilty. And it points its finger at all of us and says, you're guilty. But the blood of Jesus said, I've been buried in his name. I've been baptized in his blood. I've been redeemed. And so I can stand here before you and hear you say, well done. Not because of the good in me, but because of the blood that was shed at Calvary. So Calvary was a big deal, huh? He brought redemption, redemptive blood back to a guilt. One drop of blood fell to the scales, covered my transgressions, and every time I failed. Thank God for the blood. Somebody ought to say thank God for the blood. What a great event. First coming brought Calvary, brought blood. The second coming brings his everlasting, abiding, eternal presence. Forever and ever. Huh? Hmm. 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 On the great day of atonement in the tabernacle in the wilderness, half of the children of Israel on, the, on, on one mountain, half on the other mountain, literally millions standing with bated breath, with unbelievable anticipation, with both dread and excitement all mixed together at the same time. The high priest went beyond the veil, was translated literally. I can't find a gate. I can't find a door. I can't find an opening in that veil. The only thing I can figure is he was literally translated through that veil, like Christ walked through the wall after he was resurrected. Translated through the veil. You find a door in a veil, and I challenge you to do it. I just can't figure it out. He was translated through that veil, and he had blood from the altar. He disappeared from sight with blood, and he sprinkled that blood, and he took hyssop, which is what they made brooms out of, he would dip it, he, he sprinkled that blood on the mercy seat, which was the, the, the blood covered the law. Are you with me? We're judged by the law, but when the blood covers the law, we're judged by the blood. I won't be judged by the blood. Thank God for the blood. Okay. And then he took this broom stuff, this hyssop, and he dipped it in the blood, and he 
And that place was gold and beaten gold as mirrors. It was like a house of mirrors. You could see 15, 20 levels deep. It was just, it was transparent walls, ceiling. It was just, it was just unbelievable. And he was just slinging, slinging, slinging. Blood everywhere, as far as you could see. Levels and le- blood, 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 blood. Thank God for the blood. They're still standing out there wondering what's going on. Millions standing out there wondering what's he doing. Slinging blood. But it was only on the, when the high priest returned. <laughs> when he returned, the atonement was complete. You're not saved until he returns. Your redemption, your atonement, your salvation is going to be finished when he returns. Amen. What's he doing right now? Every time you get on your knees, he's slinging blood. Every time you say, forgive me, he's slinging blood. He's making, he's standing between you and the Father, and he's making intercession. He's out of his own body, his own stripes, his own feet, his own hands. He's slinging blood. Like a Tasmanian devil just spinning and slinging because you're repenting. But that won't be finished. What happened when the high priest walked out of the blood slinging ceremony? There was a shout. If he never returned, it wouldn't have mattered. He wasn't innocent. He had a bell and a pomegranate, a bell and a pomegranate r- around the bottom of his robe and a rope tied around his right leg. And he went beyond the veil. And if they ceased to hear the sound of the bell and the pomegranate rattling together, they knew the priest was not worthy to sling the blood. And he drug that dead man out of there. But this dead man, the grave couldn't hold this man. And when he returns from making intercession for us, it'll be complete. Hmm. I'm just glad he's still slinging blood. And when he walked out of that holy of holies and out of that holy place and he exited that tabernacle, what do you think those Jews did? Well, that was a good day. Praise the Lord, brothers, sisters. Preacher did all right today. Let's go to Western Sizzling. What do you think he did? Ah! They were high-fiving and chest-bumping and screaming to the great. Ah! It was an ultimate party. It was the ultimate high because the high priest did it. When he comes back the second time, you know what he'll be doing? Oh, you didn't do it. He did it. He won the game. He passed the test. We're going to worship the high priest who's after the order of Melchizedek without beginning and without end. The creator of the ends of the earth and the world. In the beginning, the word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace. Somebody ought to be praising the Lord on Wednesday night. And I'm one minute late, and I'm usually done way before now, and i got to go pack boxes. When he returns the second time, it's all over but the shout. It's all over but the worship. It's all over but the praise. But we ought to praise him right now like he's already come back. Because I believe that the promise of he who shall come will come is fairly imminent. Hebrews said in a little while, The Greek word for in a little while is micron, in the smallest, tiniest of moments. 
in the tiniest of moments, he who shall come will come in a micron of time, in the twinkling of an eye. Since no man can know the day nor the hour, we ought to be doing like Paul was. Watching. The early church believed he was coming. It didn't happen. But it was that hope that kept them hanging on. It was that hope that caused them not to rescind Christ whenever their children were fed to the lions in the Roman Colosseums. It was that hope as they were dipped in paraffin in Nero's garden. Nero, Nero would literally dip Christians in paraffin and light them on fire like a candle and walk through his garden at night lit by burning Christians. And listen to their screams and laugh maniacally. And they never denied the Lord. Why? Why would you not deny the Lord? Why would you, why would you not deny the Lord if they were feeding your baby boy to a lion? Why wouldn't you rescind your relationship with Christ? Because you understood that it's just a little while you're going to get to see him again anyway. Comfort one another with these words. And it's been that hope that's caused revival all over the world in the darkest of times in the Great Depression, coming out of the Great Detre Depression with the Great Tent Revivals, where there were 50, 60, 70,000 people would walk for days to go to a tent revival with no air conditioning, swat mosquitoes. Because it's the greatest promise. That promise will drive you if you believe it. And I'm just trying to convince you to believe it a little bit more on a Wednesday night when you leave here. And let me finish right now. There is a generation that will not sleep the sleep of death. We might be that generation. Paul thought he was that generation. We might be that generation. Scripture says that we have hope in this life only. We'd be miserable. If in this life only we have hope, we are of all men most miserable. 1 Corinthians 15, 59. We need something else to hope for but a paycheck and a weekend. God bless you. Let's stand together. In this world you will have trouble, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. In this world, you'll have bankruptcies and divorce and cancer. Death. Rebellion. But I got a promise. Jerry, if you'll do these line drills, and you'll shoot 1,000 free throws a day, and you'll do 500 layups a day, and you'll run 6,522 sets of bleachers every day, and you'll let me cuss you out three or four times a week. You might be able to play basketball for me one of these days. And that's all the promise I had to do all those that stupid stuff I did. My knees are hurting right now because of it. But the Lord says, I'm going to give you some walls of jasper, gates of pearl, streets of gold, eternal city of presence of the Lord. There'll be no tears, no crying, no pain. And all you got to do is repent of your sins. And let me sling. I think that's a promise worth living for. That's a promise th worth putting up a little pain. A little bit of suffering in this world. You may be suffering in this world. Quit feeling sorry for yourself. He suffered more than you did so that you could hang on to the promise. He said, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the Father. All the authority and power of the Godhead rests on him. He has all the power of the universe. Why? Because he endured the cross and despised the shame. It wasn't his birthright. It was the trial that he went through. It's not your birthright. You're not, you weren't born to be here. It's the trials that you've been through. We're made overcomers by the word of our testimony and the blood of the Lamb. The blood of the Lamb is his trial. The word of our testimony is our trial. We can make it. we got a promise. 
the older you are, the better the promise gets. You start that transition from hoping in this life to hoping in the next. I feel that transition in me. Been blessed. Had great days and horrible days in my life. Had the best and the worst. It's worth hanging in there. Don't get too high on the good days and don't get too low on the bad days. You got a promise. Worth hanging in there for. Would you lift your hands to the Creator, to the hyssop spreading God? Woo! Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Take a promise home with you. A promise that outlives governments and jobs and marriages and death and every problem in this world. There's a transcendent promise. And that's the promise that the Lord's going to come and take us home. And so shall we ever. Be with the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hmm. There's got to be victory in the house because we got a promise. We can't walk around defeated with a head down. There's got to be victory in the house. As long as I've ever preached on Wednesday night, I just feel it. There's got to be victory in the house. Let's let it happen. What do you say? I know you got kids to get up and get ready for school. I hadn't had supper yet. I don't remember the last time I ate or what it was. It's been good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. You glad you came to church tonight? Can we just give him a big old hand clap of praise? Of the offering, if you'd like to give, we want to thank you. I also want to say, Deborah, would you, uh, on behalf of Deborah, who they lost her mother, and ceremonies were this week, and and uh, I had to be traveling, and many of the church people supported. But on behalf of her, thank all of you that participated. But Sister Deborah, you're in our thoughts and our prayers. Your father's in our thoughts and our prayers, and we want to be your friend. You're a wonderful lady, and uh, we. We're thankful to see you on Wednesday night. Amen. It's a, we're the family of God. I mean, I said we're the family of God. That means we don't have, that means we stick together through thick and thin. Man, I can fight my brother, but you better not. Because all of a sudden you got three of us to whoop. We're pretty salty fellows. Let's stick together. When one of us goes through it, let's all go through it with them. When one of us rejoices in the blessing, let's not be jealous of the blessing. Let's rejoice in the blessing. When Kevin has a bad day, I had a bad day. I was spitting mad because he's my brother. We can do it, can't we? We can all, we can all go down to heaven arm in arm. One of these things say, we made it together. Praise God. God bless you. We'll see you on Sunday. Bring somebody with you.